Um, so anyway, I want to talk about the connection, which I suppose I've been involved in, between, in a sense, the city, the reinvention of the city, the changing city, culture and creativity, and that particular connection. And when you think back into the late 80s, that connection wasn't as obvious as, as, it, as it is now. And so let's just sort of try and look at that a bit more closely. Um, the core argument, I suppose, I'm making about the management and the creation of places is quite obvious that the cultural perspective determines what a place is like, and that in a sense, creativity is the lifeblood of a, a developing and evolving and emerging place. And I suppose at the beginning, at the very beginning, and I'm thinking back to the late 80s, the main reason why this all came about, at least in my mind, was this issue about distinctiveness, really about what are the cultural resources, what is special about a place when a world is obviously globalising, all the things you, you, you know about. And what I was really interested in, I used to count obsessively, I remember a project we did in the mid-80s in Basildon, counting all the shots, and it was depressing, there were 87 shots, and unfortunately I knew 78, and I thought, shit! <laughs> then I went to Oxford and then went down to South High Street and knew again sort of 85. You would have known them as well. So that issue of distinctiveness was one of the real uh, primary initial triggers of the whole idea. And I just want to show you, this is obviously Venice, as you know, and that problem about distinctiveness, what is real, what is fake and so on, continues to this day. I mean, this clearly is known as Campbell, this is the Venice B9. Uh, this is uh, Macau, which is a copy of Venice. It's the Venetian Hotel in uh, uh, Macau. But indeed, uh, although it looks vaguely like Venice, or doesn't, <laughs> depending on what you see, that in turn is back to Venice, which is partly an advert, as you know, when you go to Venice, it's all basically an advert. And that is Macau on the third floor, which is the Grand Canal in uh, Venice on the third floor. In fact, basically, it's a shopping centre. And so you've probably been to some of these places. And unfortunately, one of the slides that seems to have skipped was the Venetian in Las Vegas. So the Macau uh, Venice was a copy of a copy. And this is near the station in Venice, which is a copy of a copy of a copy <laughs> of Venice. So just reminding us, in other words, if you say things are a bit complicated. Now the other thing is about Soho. I don't know if you've noticed, obviously there is Soho, and there's Soho in London, Soho in New York, South Houston Street is what Soho means. But um, I've been collecting pictures, and I'm not going to show you 40 pictures of Soho, but this is another version of this, of this same problem. The Soho coffee chain, which has 300 shops. Um, the Soho bar. Uh, but this is the really big Soho, this is the Soho Galaxy, because this is South and the Deed in Beijing, and not in China as it be. So you've got a Soho Galaxy. So there's all Soho's everywhere you go, there is a Soho. I know we know what that means, but we're just back to that question about what is real, what is distinctive, what is the essence of, what is great about a place. So essentially, one of the triggers of all of this idea was that issue of who am I and what is my identity. Now one of the things that struck me as I was sort of thinking about this and doing that over the years was that the cities we love, we can't build anymore because the economic dynamic sort of pushes them away. So if you want to do things, and I'm always asking people, what do you like about cities? And they say certain words. And although I do think there's a possibility to do things well, Nevertheless, the sort of words you see here, which is the words people say what they want about a place, and usually they want about, in a great place, they want things that are contradictory. You want excitement and calm. You want chaos and order. You want a mix of various things, different types of people, young and old, and all of those things together. So these are the sort of words people say, but unfortunately, it's incredibly easy to say and incredibly difficult to do. And so the creative city agenda, in one way, is how can we imaginatively think through doing that? And although it's easy to say, it's incredibly um, complex. Obviously, you all know about the rule systems, planning things, people influencing things, 
interest groups, and so on. So one of the things we were involved in initially, and that changed over time, this was the beginning, we're talking late 80s, mid 80s, was very much saying, well, what are the cultural resources? Are they artists? Can that thinking that is involved in the arts, which legitimizes inventive thinking, legitimizes being imaginative, apply to city making? And I'm just going to rush through a couple of examples to show the sort of things that began to happen. This is Amtra Park in Germany, which I think is one of the great reinventions of places and areas in the world. Well, you can see uh, this here, which is just old industrial settings, and here you can climb around those cranes and stuff like that. It's very interesting materials. Uh, Nick Park, the lighting designer, did, did that. So that's an example of the same type of thing that one was talking about then. Another version of this, this is um, Tirana in Albania, and as you probably know, man, said, you know, it's all depressing, I can't really do anything about the inside of it. It's poor. What I can do is change the sort of psychological perspective of looking at the visual experience of place. So here, for example, is a route that is broadly towards the airport. At least you know it's this way, rather than that way, in general, um, and so on. So the city there is about 500 buildings that have been painted. Now I'm not suggesting that painting the city makes it creative, but it does psychologically have an effect because we all know that colour has an effect. Because the sort of things we were beginning to think about at the beginning is what is the sensory perspective of a city? And there's a little book about that. How does the city feel when you look at it through each of the senses that you have, which is of course a resource? Was it sound like? Was it feel like? Was it touch like? And so on. So the sort of examples we were really interested in is like here in Roubaix, where someone had a swimming pool and then someone else said, well, I'm to museum. The guy in the swimming pool said, well, I'm giving up the swimming pool. Why don't you just put the museum in the swimming pool? And what happens here, as you can imagine, people don't walk on water, but fashion shows and things like that happen when you cover the water and, and so on. So what you're beginning to see is an element of playfulness. This is a recent one. These are all local examples I've just showed you. But this is a lovely one I discovered in Kushitsa recently. This is a typical post-communist uh, block. Um, there are many of them in Kushitsa. Kushitsa, the second biggest city in, in Slovakia, an industrial city. And they were knocking down all these old buildings as that happened. And they did a survey and said, well, would you allow us to put the old building on top of the apartment block? <laughs> Everybody says, no, of course you can't put the apartment block. It just won't work. But this particular building <laughs> said, yes, you can put the old building on top of the apartment block. And here it is. Yeah. Um, now, of course, it's completely insane. And I'm not saying this. I'm just trying to start this in a way that we realize you can be playful. And we've lost the art of playfulness in thinking about city making. Um, here's another example, which I think is quite important. This is in uh, uh, Tainan, in, in, in Taiwan, where someone in a classic urban engineering approach said, we got to widen the road and ran a six-lane highway through the city. There were such protests that they only managed to knock off half the buildings. So they, the protests were so large yeah, that they had to stop. So now, along this kilometre, there are these half buildings, which are effectively one of the longest pieces of artwork in, in, in a city in Taiwan. Um, nearly enough of that. We'll just go to Italy, because I have two Italian friends here. This is Mauro Felicori. And he was the head of culture in Bologna. He was a very inspiring man and stuff like that. The politics changed, and the, and the other faction said, we're going to punish you and put you into cemeteries. You have to get go into cemeteries. So this poor guy, this lovely guy, went into cemeteries, but he thought, okay, I'll show you buggers. And he invented the Association of Significant Cemeteries, where he brings cemeteries to life, so the dead speak. There's all sorts of activities in the cemetery. So this is Chatoza, you can look it up in, in Bologna. And he then got a Cosa Nostra award for his urban reinvention, or reinventing, or bringing cemeteries uh, to life. So that's enough 
in the sense of this first little thing I'm trying to say is that we initially thought, in terms of the creative city, that culture was a resource. You could be playful, you could use the artistic imagination, you could make you think all of those types of things. So one of the questions people asked right at the beginning was why creativity? What's so interesting, special, and so on about this theme? Now, from my perspective, and I know there have been criticisms, you know, because people said, oh, what you're talking about is all just marketing and rubbish and all that. It's from my perspective, it's really about a matter of survival. Survival in the sense, I'm not saying it's one minute before midnight, but graffiti is always interesting. This is in Tel Aviv, because when you read graffiti, in a sense, it's telling you, you know, uh, what, what, what is really going on. Um, so, for me, and this, I know it's easy to say these words, but for me, creativity is a renewable resource. If you are, if you have a mindset that allows itself to be curious and all of that, it's renewable. And therefore, one of the preconditions for innovation and development. And what's interesting and fascinating for me is that heritage, which is contrasted to it, is a non-renewable resource. But in fact, of course, they're great partners. Because that which we define as heritage was once deemed to be creative, which is why we've allowed it to be heritage and become heritage. So, this for me, this is, this is, I know this is a slide, and I won't have too many words on slides, but do you see why, for me personally, this was an interesting little insight? Now, the problem about getting into this debate, which we were involved in then, and still are, is that, of course, it all sounds very opaque. It's unclear. People say, what is the evidence? Prove to me, you know, the sort of accountancy-driven calculation about things. When we know that it's often those things that are rather invisible and incalculable, uh, this is not moving, it is, uh, or the intangible things, the invisible things, that often make the extra in a place to make it interesting. So that is one of the big struggles, and has been one of the big struggles, and because my own sense is that this area is important, and as cities emerge, they're very fragile, um, it's always been quite problematic. It certainly was very problematic until about the year 2000. So in essence, the Crazy City, the fact book, you know, 300 pages, the one sentence summary of it is, in a world that's changing dramatically, how can you create the conditions within which we can think, plan, and act imaginatively in order to solve problems and generate opportunity. So that's what, in essence, it is. Its focus of what is that thing that you need to be imaginative changed since the late 80s to today, and I'm going to take on the journey of what I think that might be. And partly what it's about is increasing the footprint of a place increasing its resonance, increasing its sense of being and its presence in the world. So that's how I've seen it. Now lots of people have used this thing very much as a marketing tool and have said, uh, I'm creative, it's very boring because you see all these cities that say I'm creative. I always say, never call yourself creative. Let someone else wonder about the interesting things you have done and say, aren't you creative? And you know, and you, you get the drift. So that, that's what I'm thinking about. Now the other thing is, of course, this is Brunelleschi's uh, the, the cathedral, this is Florence, this is the inside. Now of course cities have always been imaginative. They've always been the lo laboratories, Peter Hall, so Peter Hall, who unfortunately died recently, the laboratories of solving the problems of their own making. That's what cities tend to do, at least they try to do it. They might now, in the context of the sort of escalating problems, perhaps not do that. But that was always the case. The difference between then and now is that we have self-conscious strategies to think about it, which is very different from just people doing their thing. And we have, you know, schemes, support systems, and so on, that you all know about. So in that sense, this notion of creativity is rather like a currency. It's, it's an asset which is partly supplanting things like location and all those other things that are of course also very important in city making. 
Now, another thing that I think is quite interesting, and this is me being jaded and a bit grey-haired and all that sort of stuff, is for so many years, and I've probably done, it doesn't matter how many studies I've done on, trying to prove the value of good design, green thinking, heritage, art, creativity, all of these things. I don't want to even back on about it. It's very boring. And I never answer that question anymore. Because the person who asks you that question is saying, justify yourself. But tell me. I say, this is a liberation. I've only changed one word. But this one word has been, or two words, has been a real liberation. I say, what is the cost of the country? Tell me what the cost of not going with the grain of the culture of a place is like. What are those places? Name me a city that is successful which has not done that, which has not thought about these issues. And I believe one will find that they're less successful than those that do go with the grain. But it also forces that person who is so skeptical to justify their saying not. So for me, and I changed my mind a few years back, because initially I started off with the notion of creativity, and then I suddenly realised, working in an incredibly poor area, I was running a commission in the North East of England, and I realised, hey, actually, you can't just say to some young people whose parents are being unemployed, be an entrepreneur, or be this and all of that, when they've gone through 35 years of that or whatever. But I suddenly realised that curiosity is actually even more than that. And that the basic cycle of all of this starts with encouraging curiosity. And once we are curious somehow, and that means going with the brain of people's interests, young people, whatever it is, one may become imaginative. One may have something, your, your mind opens and your thinking opens. Out of which there may be some ideas which we could deem to be created. Out of which some might be useful and then become, that same invention, a social invention, a physical invention, any type of invention. And when applied, may become an innovation, which then leads to further, uh, uh, you know, processes and so on. This is the final thing, perhaps, on the art thing. I just a very interesting, I know it's a bit old, but this is a map, a school map, I know it's boring, but all you need to know is this. This is a relationship between Countries that have high levels of participation in art, left, and high levels of innovation, right. Now, is it interesting the parallel between <coughs> countries that have high participation in art and involvement, direct participation, and a level of innovation in general in that country? I think it's an incredibly significant summary. Uh, anyway, I won't bore you with it. That's all you need to know. That's what that white stuff says. But clearly, there's more to creativity than that. And over the last years, since the Shanghai Expo, there have been cities all around the world been asking themselves that question. What is the next step? What have we done? Why are the places we live in not quite as we imagine them in our planners' dreams and in our ideal cities and so on? Why don't we dare a dream again, but have some sort of vision, image, or something of what could be. And I think that in the end, when you look at it and you talk to people, and I don't know if you agree, please disagree with me, there are sort of five or six things that I think are incredibly important. And they may be significant, I think. The first, places that seem to work well, which we might call livable, creative, interesting, whatever, have something about memory. They're not erasing memory. They're doing something with the memory. They have it there. These are places of anchorage. So that's the first thing. The second thing I think they have, this is Genoa memory. It could be anything, London memory or whatever else, memory. The second thing is they're also places of possibility. This is the National Library in Singapore. I just grabbed that picture. Lots of people were going into this room of possibility. I have no, can you hear me at the back or not? Yeah. yeah, it's okay because it's just sort of crackling each time we get too close. Uh, I don't know what they're doing in that room, but anyway, it's called a possibility room. But it is relevant to me that a place that's interesting has possibility as well as anchorage of some form. Anchorage could be tradition, someone you know, the familiar, it can be physical, it can be non physical. And thirdly, it's about connection physical connection between different people, between different 
you know, being part of here and the wider world, it can be transport links, it can be all of that thing, connection. Fourthly, it's something about learning, learning, growing, having the opportunity to self-improve. And finally, it's about some form of inspiration. Inspiration will differ, you know, for some people it might be the mosque or the church, for others it might be a museum, a gallery, or some other thing that lifts them out of the ordinary. And I think these things have held true in spite of all the movements of change that have gone along in the city. Now, the central question, as this disappears, or for me, and I think we all know about it, is obviously the sort of speed of transformation that has occurred everywhere in you know, the way the economy works, the way we communicate, and various other things like that. Um, so, you know, obviously Britain has fewer of these than in Ukraine, in fact, and we've shifted, obviously, in the West, in Western Europe at least, from that sort of production to value-added and created out of ideas in some sort of way. Clearly, there is production in other parts of the world, obviously. And this happens to be Detroit, and uh, it doesn't matter if it's Detroit, but you get the drift of what's happening there. And this is, the next thing is Derby. And this was very significant, actually, in relation to the Creative City agenda, and particularly that aspect that was called then the cultural industry, now the creative industry. I disagree with that terminology, by the way, but that doesn't matter. Because I think lots of things are creative. It's not only these sectors that are creative. But anyway, when that went down, Coincidentally, there were also statistics showing that the exports, I'm sure you probably remember that, the export of the music industry was more than the exports of the car industry. And then people suddenly said, hey, hold on a moment. There's this stuff I don't know about, these guys with beards and sort of maybe long hair, and they're exporting more than the car industry. There must be something going on here. And then particularly, when they took the fragments of graphics, music, design, film stuff together, which is of course all interrelated, they suddenly saw it was a powerful sector. The other thing, of course, that was happening as well at the same time, and affected what we're talking about, is, is nomadism, or whatever you want to call it, the world is a smaller place. And that world being a smaller place, with all the opportunities, the delights of diversity, but the tensions of diversity, um, uh, obviously transform things. And within that, the way cities operated was also changing because then expertise, skilled people, people with ambition, and all of that could move around. And of course you want in cities people to move around, leave, but you also want them to come back. But unfortunately what's been happening is that too many cities have lost the interesting people they might have, and a few cities have gathered more. So this churn is the key challenge for cities. How do you generate that churn that people leave, come back? Added to which, the shift to the east. And the shift to the east has really been quite dramatic. And I don't need to tell you about that, but obviously we know that, that rise in confidence in the east, which has really meant that some places have again gone downhill. And so then the creative city, they, ideas, I don't know which year I'm talking about now, but let's say the mid-90s, began to think, well, what are the other types of resources beyond these artistic ones I've talked about, cultural ones, that a city could have? And that then, in my mind at least, began to say, well, it's what you've got in your mind, it's what you've got in your head, can you think, can you strategize, can you add value out of nothing, and so on. So collectively, looking at all of this together, you could say, it's not necessarily a paradigm shift, but the, that world that evolved was beginning to be different. Now, I'm just going to go, this is Hong Kong, the lit uh, off from the presentation is still in Hong Kong. You could say, this is the historic London, uh -huh, which is black. Because every history of the city is different, of course, because whatever it is. But, what I then decided, because I simplify things, and I apologize about my simplification, I hope you don't mind that in the university, but I simplify too much. But basically, I think that if you take the post-war period, you can define 
the sort of city 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. And the first one is very hardware driven. It's very much about the urban engineering approach. It's very to do with things like this. Uh, this is warehousing rather than housing, perhaps. So if you just think about what it looks like, and even if you look out of the window and there may be a false plant, it's still slightly barren and so on. And there's an approach which is the opposite of what we were talking about before, about the sensory feeling. And I lived here for six weeks, here just on the left. And I'm not telling you which Australian city this is. But whoever designed that didn't actually think what it feels like to live here and to want to go over to the other side. So I hope they don't do that anymore. And here's Dubai, which that looks a bit like, you know, Fritz Lang's film Metropolis. But the fact is, you can't really actually navigate the city, even inside the heat, that you could have been imaginative in how to deal with that. Um, and unfortunately, this is sometimes taken as the model of the new city. Now, I'm not against engineering, of course I'm not, because things need to stand up, etc., uh, etc. Et but I'm just saying there's often a lack of sensitivity. Now, allied to that was always a sort of cultural approach, which very much is about, like here, it has a sort of repertoire. That repertoire is to have a series of institutions, you know, like there, this is a Finnish city, on the left is the theatre, on the right is that, and then over there is the concert hall, and they're all blobs in the environment. They're open usually from five to nine, and they're closed, and they don't speak to the city. They don't give everything back to the city. And inside these buildings may be interesting things happening, and allied to that is obviously things like festivals and so on, which you know about. And particularly, what I'm interested in, I do sub-surveys, and one of them is about public art. This is Paris, just in case. It could be anywhere, but it's Paris. This is Paris. We love Paris. But the public art is red. Uh, could you please, in your work, please do a survey of how many pieces of public art are red proportionally versus green versus yellow? And I believe most of them will be red. So that's a bit like after the event, trying to beautify it. And often this hardware approach, this again, I went back, well, I will tell you, it's in Lisbon. This costs 80 million euros, this whole structure here. But essentially, I'm always asking myself the question, what would have the impact have been if we put this in an endowment fund? You would have been able to support new activity, in my view, forever, if there had been a slight shift. So that first approach is really linear thinking. You can read the words, I don't need to say what they are. Um, siloed approach to an organization. So then, there is people said, this is again very useful because of athletes just in passing, um, they said, look, let's think about this differently. Let's drag the old thinking about cities out. There must be another way of looking at it. This is a planning consultancy and getting to lovely. Uh, anyway, there must be another way of thinking this through. And we could call this, for the sake of argument, soft urbanism. But the essence of this number two version of the way you look at a city is linking hardware thinking and software thinking together. And then you immediately already have a new creativity problem. Because given that education is normally siloed, it's actually incredibly creative to try and bring the software and the hardware thinkers together and that in itself is a creative act. So that then begins to shift the emphasis, in my view, or at least one should include it as well, of trying to work across boundaries of disciplines and so on. And this 2.0 thing, which you know happens a bit late 80s, early 90s, going on and on and on, is really about understanding how the city feels, rediscovering that the city in essence is a place of transaction and exchange and things like that. We bring in new words like atmospherics, a whole new vocabulary begins to develop in terms of planning and city making. And there are some dramatic interventions that you know about. Uh, I'm sure there's a Korean in this room, but they will know that this is Chong Chong, one of the main arteries in, in Seoul, where the mayor then became the president, said, OK, let's get rid of this, and this eight kilometers has become one of the main meeting places of Seoul. It was once an aunt. But where did the cars go? He said, I don't know. 
<laughs> but it was fine because the network, in contrast to Dubai, where each grid is a kilometer long, when you've got a grid which is a kilometer and there's a problem somewhere there, you've already got a traffic jam. In Seoul, the grid is smaller. So if you look at grids of cities, Barcelona versus New York, blah, 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 you will see that those that are tighter have more escape routes, and therefore Seoul works, even though it lost that major artery. Here is, you know, Chicago, you will know that, where, you know, this is Millennium uh, Park, and in a sense, the uh, cars are still there, but they're underground. And this, of course, is, 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 is the high line. But this second phase that I'm calling 2.0 is very much really trying to retrofit the possibilities of conviviality, uh, which obviously are very important in city making. And even one of the things I think is interesting, because this is part of this period, and this is one of my little slogans, is that yesterday's innovation can become today's plastic. So you've got there the Eiffel Tower, which was an innovation then, it's a sort of plastic, next to a new innovation, which is the museum, uh, what's it called, Barney, uh, which is a hydroponic building, which you could say that's greenwash because it's just green. Is it really green? But in a sense, it's about perception and trying to perceive, show a message through the physical environment without saying green. Oh, shit, I've got five minutes. <laughs> right, then I need to learn how long I'm supposed to speak. But anyway, we'll move on. Um, so culture 2.0 is then more focused on the creative economy type things. Uh, you know, old buildings, sorry, of which there are thousands, barracks and things like that. They often are used, of course, the new incubation centres. All of that we're very familiar with. But this is challenging, co-working spaces and so on, is challenging the paradigm of how one works and how uh, one does things. Um, so this happens to be in Rotterdam and it's called the Creative Factory. And one of the interesting things about that is that, for example, here's a museum, it was a, a, a conference about comeback cities, and I thought, do I want to see a textile museum? Not sure. And then I realized that the museum's director was an anthropologist, and what he created in the textile museum with those machineries he created new textiles using old and new machinery together. And so you're beginning to get new combinations. And interesting things like here in Arnhem, which is the fashion quarter, where social housing, this is all social housing, where the, the, the social housing organization said, how can we get young people actually have production retailing outlets? So they used all the places on the bottom on the ground floor to allow young startup companies. Now you know all about this, you know, this is all about clustering, this is the Istanbul Music Centre. But one of the problems about it is that of course then Prada and these other shops come in and can pay six times the amount of rent, which of course, and I don't need to elaborate here, destroys precisely the things that make the place what it is. And what you then got is this culture commerce link, like this is Ferragamo in, in next to Ferragamo in Florence, where there's a Marilyn Monroe exhibition because she wants more Ferragamo shoes. You're trying to give shoes more value because shoes are basically shoes. And then 200 meters away is the bag shop. I'm sorry, it's Gucci Museum to sell bags. So all of that reached its apex, I think, with Louis Vuitton in using artists like Yoyo Kusama to again sell their product. And all of this is obviously going on at the same time. And that's Banksy subverting the Museum of Bristol, basically commenting on that. Now, the other version of that, of course, is all the stuff about star architecture, which you know more about than me. Um, and here's the latest steps of Demura thing in Hamburg, which is an opera house with apartments and, and stuff like that, the Philharmonic, rather. Um, but this is something I took, I don't know if you can see this, this is an area of Zurich, which is the same process happening, gentrification. There's a Renaissance hotel there, a Renaissance. Then the one building that the a group kept, they with the same writing <laughs> resistance. So this is 
When I took that photo, I thought, shit, this is just so brilliant. Because <laughs> it says everything in one encapsulation, therefore I need another five minutes. Because when it was over to a night, I was over to a night, I was She's my friend. <laughs> um, no, I don't want to bang on too much, but can I speak for another 10 minutes? Is it alright? Yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, if it's boring, just tell me to shut up. <laughs> um, so, anyway, you know that joke about a picture tells a thousand words? I mean, this says 10,000 words. Um, anyway, that city is more, you know, organic and all of these words, and it's very consumption driven and so on. But now, really, it's about spectacularizing the city. But now that we're in this new phase, which let's call it 3.0, which just reminds us that the economy is different. You know, of course, it used to be one idea, one producer, one distributor going to the households, very static and so on. But the newer production process, which a lot of you are involved in, but as I talked to a couple of you, you know, you link, you connect with various people, you do funny sort of configurations in terms of production, supply chains, you distribute in new ways. And just looking at that image versus the other static image, you realise that this place, that is 3.0, is physically and in many ways completely different. It's really obviously where the here-there phenomenon is happening simultaneously. So, sorry, just go. So you get here, like in Amsterdam, these guys working in a container. They're working not locally, they're working internationally, and they seem to be surviving. And that's all to do with things you know about pop culture and so on. But also where things like offices, the lovely German invention, where you take that office, you close it, and like a dog, you can walk around with the office, yeah? So you can move somewhere else. Pretty clever. <laughs> Quite clever. We used to be clever on <laughs> something anyway. Um, so, I don't want to say all the cliché words that you know of, but the implication of them is very different in terms of how the city functions, um, which is obviously more about, you know, networking, collaborating, all of these, 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 these words. And the culture there, the cultural version of that, is much more about making it yourself. Like, here is Restaurant Day in Finland, in Helsinki. It was forbidden to put restaurants on the street. So through social networking, someone said, on the 15th of May 2012, there will suddenly be restaurants everywhere. And suddenly, if you do restaurants for that, then they said, it's forbidden. And then they said, but our strategy says we want a vibrant city. Isn't this exactly the vibrant city we want? Now the mayor, of course, promotes this restaurant day and look it up. It's a very, it's a sort of, what, what, you know, pretty wide movement. So things like TEDx are obviously part of all, of all of that. So in sum, the city 3.0 culture 3.0 require a different level of attractiveness and quality of the city, and they have a different operating dynamic. So there the city is more co-creative, all of these words that again, this isn't sort of jumping up, but where people are thinking about new ways of thinking about urbanity and so on. So really, in the end, we're saying, what is it that's making this city that's interesting? It's somehow a combination of the village feel with something that is also that open, cosmopolitan <coughs> thing. Now, what's the next step? I think the next step on creativity is to address the wicked problems, the intractable. That's why in our series now, the next session is about how do you creatively address a really, really difficult problem? And that, I believe, is the next step. And I think that the qualities of this new urbanity that begins to think about that has a few features. And the first is about the right to the city, the responsibility, old concept, but nevertheless, it's about that. And it has a few things. And I'm using the word civic urbanity because it's so clumsy that nobody will make it popular. You know, like the creative city, the problem is it sort of empties out, becomes meaningless. Uh, whereas civic urbanity, I can't imagine going to a course on civic urbanity, or perhaps you will. Um, but anyway, the elements of that are obviously the shared commons and the threats to it, which you know about. 
and that shared common, this happens to be Adelaide Airport. Now, how stupidly that there's a subway be here, but I'm going to show you that picture, which destroyed that. Uh, so, shared commons. The next element, these are just all versions of the shared commons. The next element, sorry, that's a library, is cultural literacy, understanding the way the other thinks and works. Of course, that's all about the intercultural city and, and so on. So, that's the second theme. But culture can, of course, as we know, be an obstacle as well as a positive thing. I don't need to elaborate on that. The third element in this uh, uh, thing about civic urbanity is, sorry, this thing isn't clicking forward, is obviously the thing about reducing inequality, and there's been so much recently about that, because you can't make a city work when the differences are too high. And you need that because the city needs to harness the collective intelligence of the different types of people who exist in their city. The fourth is obviously eco-consciousness, and this is obviously a great example of Malmö Western Harbour, which I'm sure you all know about. But I see when you can see actually how it's made green. They'd say, you know, all of the examples. The fifth is I like the idea of someone who said, not earth planning, but healthier earth planning. So every bit of planning that you do in the city, it makes you healthy. Not by going to the gym, but by you just navigating the city. You become healthy, rather than having to do a specific thing, like go to the gym. Now I saw this in, in Lexington, Kentucky. It said, American National Walking Tattoo. It's amazing. The Americans are going to walk up. <laughs> right, I don't mean it. I don't mean it. I'm Canadian. Right, where are you? I love you. You're going to be <laughs> It said National Walking Day, but, but, that's <laughs> what they meant by National Walking Day. And the reason was, is because the place itself was unwalkable. You had to take so your machine to walk. Or here, this is mental health. This is a, a, a what do you call it? It's a, it's a justice court, which says you are guilty before you're proved innocent because of its essence and what it looks like. Whereas here in Adelaide, I'm not saying it's the best, when you go up there to the court, there's an art gallery, so at least you can look at some art before you're punished. <laughs> you get the idea, it's just about mental health. And then, the aesthetic responsibility. Have developers actually got that responsibility? Is that part of the agenda of the discussion? This here is Helsinki, the best building, and the worst, they say, according to things. The reason it's the best, it's an Alvarado building, so of course it's the best in LCP. The worst, because some people just don't like it. But nevertheless, I don't think it matters, because you're having a discussion about aesthetics. And then the other element, of course, is what I'm calling the creative city, the empowering thing, what I've already discussed. And then, that's finally a reinvigorated democracy. Only through a creative bureaucracy can you really actually do the city we want. It can't happen with the old rules. And finally, one of the ways we now measure this, how do you measure the total creative ecology, economically, social, culturally of the city, we have four things we look at personally, and we've done this in about 20 cities. How do you identify and nurture that potential? How do you enable it? How do you harness it? And how is it lived? There are all sorts of indicators we use to assess this. So the first is how do you nurture, bring that city about? And the first is this openness. Openness is the key thing. The city that is more open and closed, not 24-7 open, but open, default position open, is the key first criteria. The second is a rich learning landscape that is both professional and non-professional. Not the more 42-year-olds are learning better, rather than only people who are whatever. The enabling thing is about the political framework. Is that, in the context of digitization and all the things we know about sharing economy, has that bureaucracy adapted in its rules and regulations to allow this to happen? And this is then about strategic agility. Is the city just a place that builds what you want a car park, or is there some story being told of this future city? 
The third element in this part is trust. Professionalism and trust. Trust a distance very many survey, not very many, one survey about successful ambitious cities, and trust, which of course is very difficult to calculate, is the key issue that comes up. And then, in terms of harnessing and exploiting, is obviously allowing things to be innovative, innovating, incubating, communicating well, connecting, and so on. And finally, that lived thing is about what's your level of distinctiveness, where I started from, how vital is it, how is the place being made, and what is it? Is the new, because often you find it quite interesting, old stuff, but the new is less interesting. Is the new as good as the old? And finally, the thing that most people talk about, I suppose, is livability and well-being, the facilities and so on. So that broadly is it. And the main implication of what I'm going to say, it's really beyond the silo. And it's really asking, is your city a city of projects? Or, again, easy to say, is your project the city? Very easy to say, difficult to do. And Therefore, I'm using the old Plato's phrase, is the city, the city is a work of art, and then have one word to it. A living work of art, I don't know, it's a slow, but I think it's a useful, just a phrase to have. So, there we are. It's not about money. I think it's about a bit of just changing how we think. And that is it. Thank you very much.